Good evening. <clears throat> Good evening. So it's my pleasure to welcome you here this evening to what I feel is a very important uh, event in the life of uh, Seaperth, for sure. This event has to do with really the core of Seaperth's existence, economic policy. Tonight we are here to honor an individual who has made more, made enormous contributions to economic policy, Paul A. Volcker. Now I'm not going to tell you about Paul. <laughs> By the way, the award is for his lifetime achievements in economic policy. But I'm going to leave it for George Schultz to introduce uh, Paul Volcker. I'm instead going to tell you just a little bit about the prize. A few years ago, George Schultz received the Truman Award for Economic Policy, and he decided that he would take the award and contribute it to CEPR. The two of us discussed the idea of there being a prize, the CEPR Prize, and who should it recognize. And I do remember George says, you know, there's already a prize for the best American economist under the age of 40. That's the John Bates Clark Award. Why don't we establish a prize for the best and most influential economist over the age of 80? <laughs> now, actually, that design decision was rejected in the end. We didn't do that. Here's what we decided. First, the prize would go to an individual from any part of the world who had made or is making significant contributions to economic policy, both in writing and in action. I said significant, what significance? Well, breaking the psychology of inflation, improving monetary policy, working on job growth, restoring the confidence in Wall Street. The list could go on and on. And of course, you recognize that Paul Volcker has those achievements. But you know what I mean. There are not a lot of people who have that. Uh, list of achievements. George and I talked and decided that we needed a committee to review the nominations for the award. We asked uh, those individuals who we felt were significant contributors themselves to economic policies and observers of economic policy. Uh, one person we added was uh, many of your friend Jim Paterba, who is president of the National Bureau of Economic Research. Uh, he's a CEPR board member and a recent head of the economics department at MIT. And then we added two uh, Nobel Prize winners, our own sitting right down here, Kenneth Arrow, and Gary Becker of the University of Chicago. Now George, the former Secretary of Treasury, Labor, and State agreed to uh, chair the committee, and I joined as director of CEPR, so the five of us. We worked on the nomination process and decided that we would give the award every two years. We knew that the profile of the CEPR Prize would be defined by the initial recipient. We unanimously decided that the inaugural recipient of the CEPR Prize would be Paul Volcker. Coincidentally, he would have won the prize if we had stuck with that idea of the most influential economist over the age of 80. <laughs> we are already accepting nominations for the 2012 CEPR Prize. So if you go to our homepage, the CEPR homepage, and you click on About CEPR, and then you click on the CEPR Prize, you should be able to find your way to the nomination forms, and your nominations will be considered. Now, pretty soon I'm going to turn the program over to George so, you can make, so he can make the appropriate introduction. But before, I want to leave you with a thought. Economics is fundamentally about efficiently allocating resources so as to maximize the welfare of individuals. It is about improving people's standard of living. Economics policies such as taxes and tariffs and regulation and market design and monetary policy and transfer and entitlement programs can improve or harm the welfare of millions of people, even billions of people. What we do at CEPR is important research we try to make an impact on policymakers so that they will improve economic policies, and heavens knows there's plenty of room for improvement. This prize recognizes people who have made a big difference to the lives of millions. So I want you to enjoy the evening. Now I'm going to uh, turn things over to one of the greatest living Americans. <laughs> 
a person who has had five important public service jobs. The Secretary of Labor, the Director of the Office of Management and Budget, the Secretary of Treasury, the Secretary of State, that's four, and last but not least, service in the United States Marine Corps. George will now introduce our award winner, and uh, after dinner, George and I will come back and uh, after the dessert portion and uh, make uh, the formal presentation of the first CEPR prize. So I'm turning it over to George. The selection of Paul Volcker to be the first recipient of the CEPR prize was basically the easiest selection ever. There was no contest. Let me explain to you why. First of all, Paul has a really terrific mind. After all, he graduated summa cum laude from Princeton University, so started off very impressively. But then he has had a interesting variety of experience. He worked as a younger person at the New York Fed, at the Treasury, at the Chase Manhattan Bank. And he wound up coming back to the Treasury as the Undersecretary for Monetary Affairs. That's where I first got to know him because we worked together in a very intense period when the international monetary system basically shifted gears. The shift was well underway when I started working with Paul. But we saw that we had to have a strategy. Couldn't just bump along. And we spent a whole summer working with our colleagues in the government so whatever we proposed would have broad support. And we developed a really good plan we peddled it and announced it. It didn't really hold the day, but it was interesting to me two things. Number one, the world sort of seemed to heave a sigh of relief. The United States has a plan. We're back. We're there. And that's really important. The other thing I could see as we talked about this was the immense respect that finance ministers and central bankers all over the world had for Paul. And they wanted his opinion, they wanted his judgment, they wanted to talk about it with him. So his presence, his wisdom, was a really essential ingredient in kind of calming things down and getting somewhere. I do remember one little problem, though. I forget exactly what it was, but we wanted, we needed to have somebody go around the world in, in a very, very confidential way so nobody would know what was going on to work out something. And Paul went to do that. Of course, he went first to Japan. And Paul Volcker in Japan cannot be anonymous. He's twice as tall as anybody else in the country. So immediately our cover was blown. But anyway, other than that, uh, dealing with that problem, why uh, it worked out very well. Then of course, I think his huge, huge contribution to economic policy to our American sanity as a country was his work as chairman of the Federal Reserve in bringing inflation under control. And he did what 
was known to be necessary to do if you were going to get inflation under control. You could see that if he did it, we probably were going to have a tough period, which we did. I'll give President Reagan some credit for holding a political umbrella up there. But nevertheless, Paul's policies converted the situation of endemic inflation, kind of, kind of feeling of hopelessness, into one where we had inflation control and we still do. Right now, a few of us have to have our fingers crossed. But what Paul Volcker gave us has lasted and has been an essential ingredient to a long period of fundamentally prosperous economic growth that we've had for some quarter of a century or so. So that is a magnificent, huge achievement in itself and also as an example. And people say, what do we need in public right right now? Well, we need Paul Volcker. We need Paul Volcker's kind of guts and intelligence and wisdom to take the steps built on a long-term point of view, not a short-term point of view, about what is necessary to do. Of course, after Fe Paul left the Fed in 1987, he was not idle. He joined Jim Wilfinson in his investment bank, did that for a decade, I guess. And he has been a person who rises to the call of difficult public service jobs. On two occasions, he's headed what's become known as a VOCA commission to look after public service. What is going to happen to our civil service and how is that going to work? And Paul has devoted himself to that. Paul took on the task of investigating what has emerged as a very corrupt oil for food program in Iraq, called the shots, did it judiciously, carefully, called the shots. It was a magnificent piece of work, thankless, except by people like me who could see what was going on. But that's Paul. He's willing to step up to these difficult subjects, and I could go on and on with others. Now, here's an example of his wisdom. He loves fly fishing. I mean, he's really kind of intoxicated with it. So when he married his first wife, Barbara, he took her fly fishing on a honeymoon. With all his love of fly fishing, he didn't go fishing again for 15 years. <laughs> so Barbara died some years ago, and he recently eloped with Anka, who is here, and she's a sensational gal. But she prevailed on him not to take her fly fishing <laughs> for a honeymoon. So I have a sense of great honor a sense of privilege, a sense of friendship, having known Paul all these years, in introducing him here to give us a talk and as the first recipient of our CEPR prize, Paul Volcker. Thank you so much, George, for those overly generous comments. I have learned a few things through life. I did take my wife fishing on our honeymoon. It was a mistake, my first wife. <laughs> Anka is going to go fly fishing in August in Iceland. So things have, or July, no, August, I guess. So uh, we still have the same objective. Let me say, uh, in listening to all those uh, comments, George, that when I look back on my career of 
It has always seemed to me, in a, in a way, the most interesting and satisfying time I had was a time as Undersecretary of the Treasury for Monetary Affairs, and you were the Secretary and working with you and under you at a most interesting time for what was then a fairly young fellow was really a high point of my career. And you mentioned about public service. And I will never, something's falling over here. Here we are. Uh, you know, when I think back, and that was, what, 40 years ago or more, that some of that zest for public service that George Schultz has reflected in his life and that I felt in my life, too much of that has been lost in this country and other countries. And I really wish that somehow or another we can deal with what has been, in fact, a loss of trust in government, maybe an ineffectiveness in government, because there can be a, a lot of challenge, a lot of satisfaction when it gets done. Let me say I don't have to emphasize how greatly honored I am to be the, the very first recipient of the CEPA Prize for Contributions to Economic Policy. Now, in this particular setting, I, I do recall that I was one of those men and women that George Schultz invited to participate in an advisory role at the very start of the Institute. And with George's vision and drive and joined by all the distinguished scholars and practitioners at Stanford and elsewhere, some of which I've gotten to know, the Institute is truly making a contribution to thinking about how to bring the insights of, econo of the economic profession to the challenge of achieving growth and stability. And I haven't got any doubt that that challenge has gotten harder in recent years. Now I do, if I may say so, recall my last participation in the CEPR conference that was just about five years ago. And I went back and looked at it, it's kind of engraved on my mind, but I wanted to get the word straight. And at that conference, I lamented that, and I'm quoting, the growing imbalances, the disequilibria, the risks are giving rise to circumstances as dangerous and intractable as any I could recall, and I recall quite a lot. They were intractable not just because of the combination of complicated issues, but because there seemed to be so little willingness and so little capacity to do much about it. Now, you are familiar, I'm sure, with large parts of that story. In those years and in the years following, the United States savings practically disappeared. Consumption rose way past its past relationships to nat national production. The consumption, our consumption, was satisfied by rapidly growing imports from China and elsewhere in Asia. Those imports came at remarkably cheap prices, and so that helped keep the inflation well subdued. Now, the seemingly inexorable increase in our current account deficit was easily financed by an equally large flow of short-term funds from abroad. And those funds also came at exceptionally low interest rates. In fact, money became so easily available that it supported what became a bubble in housing in our markets, rising home prices reinforcing a sense of prosperity and high consumption. Now, it wasn't so much that the imbalances were hidden or unknown. The world economy was growing strongly. Neither China nor the United States was prepared to act to balance its national budget or to restrain the consumption in the housing boom in the United States or to reduce consumption and exports in China. Now, at the time, I suggested the most likely results would not be a well thought out and complementary policy actions. Instead, sooner or later, the necessary changes would be forced by a financial crisis. Well, we've had the crisis. What remains to be seen is whether we 
will draw the right lessons from that crisis. Now, I certainly didn't anticipate at the time that the crisis would be of such force and complexity that it would affect the whole world adversely. I never imagined that the financial markets over those frightening weeks in the fall of 2008 would virtually freeze the markets. Now we know that trillions of dollars of official funds were brought to the rescue of what was, without doubt, a broken system. A trillion dollars in the form of loans, capital, and guarantees, all backed by the American taxpayer. Flows of finance have been restored now, but they've done so with large areas of continuing public support. Take the leading example, the residential mortgage market. That's by far the largest part of the capital market in the United States, and for the time being, that market remains almost wholly a ward of the federal government. Now, another range of uncertainty has arisen. Sovereign credits are coming to question, most pointedly in the Eurozone. But I have to say, also of some concern, as you well know, about some of our own states. Any thoughts? The longings that participants in the financial community might have had that conditions were returning to normal, implicitly promising the return of high compensation, should by now be shattered. We are undoubtedly left with some very large questions. First of all, questions of understanding what happened, questions of what to do about it, and ultimately questions of political possibilities. And the way those questions are answered will determine whether in the end the financial crisis has in fact forced the necessary changes in thinking and in policies, the changes necessary to restore a well-functioning financial system. Now, as you just heard a few minutes ago, the CEPA prize announcement sets out a very simple proposition a proposition I suspect we would all support. And I quote, economics is fundamentally about efficiently allocating resources so as to maximize the welfare of individuals. And I think it's fair to say that for some time that dominant approach of economic theorizing, increasingly reflected in public policy, has been that free and open financial markets supported by advances in electron electronic technology and by highly sophisticated financial engineering would most effectively support both market efficiency and stability. Without heavily intrusive regulation, investable funds would flow to the most profitable and most productive uses. The inherent risks of maturity and credit intermediation would be diffused, reallocated among those best able and willing to bear the risk. Well, that's an attractive thesis. It's attractive not only in concept, but for those participating in its seeming ability to generate enormous financial rewards. Our best business schools developed and taught ever more complicated models a large share of the nation's best talent was attracted finance. But what's happened? Even when development seemed most benign, there were warning signs. Has the contribution of the modern world of finance to economic growth become so great as to support remuneration of its participants far beyond any earlier experience and expectations? Does the finance industry justify profits amounting to 35 to 40 percent of all the profits by all the U.S. corporations over the past 10 years or so? Can the truly enormous rise in the use of derivatives, complicated options, highly structured financial instruments really have made a parallel contribution 
to economic efficiency. If so, the benefits haven't been apparent in rises in national productivity beyond past norms, and the benefits haven't been flowing down to the average American worker, who even before the crisis had enjoyed no increase in real incomes for a decade. Now, there was one great growth industry in that decade. Private debt relative to the GDP nearly tripled over the past 30 years. Credit default swaps invented little more than a decade ago soared at their peak to a $60 trillion market. And what's interesting about that is it exceeded by a factor of 10 the amount of underlying credits potentially hedged against default. Add to those specifics the opacity that accompanied the enormous complexity. The only reasonable conclusion is that we were forced to reconsider some of the basic tenets of financial theory and practice. Now, I think one basic flaw running through much of the recent market innovation is that thinking embedded in mathematics and physics could, could be directly adapted to markets. A search for repetitive patterns of behavior and computations of normal distribution curves are a big part of the physical sciences. But financial markets are not driven by changes in natural forces, but by human phenomena, with all its implications for herd behavior, for wide swings in emotion, and for political intervention and uncertainties. Most obviously and appropriately, the role of regulation and supervision, its necessity, its methods, and its difficulties needs to be re-examined. Now, in that connection, virtually all developed economies have long had official institutions responsible for regulating their banking system. And to a lesser extent, there's been oversight of financial markets and non-bank financial institutions. In the United States, all of that has been particularly complicated, and we've had a very intrusive structure. But as a broad generalization, those existing structures and all their variety largely failed to prevent cascading financial failures with severe economic damage. Now, one natural response has been a broad international effort to review capital requirements, leverage restraints, liquidity practices, and so on, extending even beyond the traditional area of commercial banking. And those are matters that, by and large, are within the existing competence of national regulatory authorities, whether or not they have administered those matters as well as they could have. There are strong precedent for coordinated action internationally. And over the past two years, there's been much useful analysis in large areas of conceptual agreement. But even with that concentrated effort, it's been difficult to reach operational consensus. That doesn't surprise me. The fact of the matter is that exercise of efficient and effective regulatory and supervisory authority is always difficult. It's difficult on a national level, and the difficulties are multiplied when dozens of countries are involved. There are political restraints. There are industry pressures. Consider that the 10-year effort to coordinate capital requirements under the rubric of so-called Basel II, an effort completed just in time to be largely rendered moot by the financial crisis. To me, the lesson's clear. There are deep-seated structural issues that must be dealt with by legislation. Now, as we meet this evening, and I guess it's night now in Washington, efforts are still going on as we, as we speak as are being debated in the United States Senate. And a lot of controversy has surrounded the bill, but I do think taken as a whole, that bill now being debated does incorporate some basic approaches that can and should be part of the international consensus. 
Now, the central issue with which we've been grappling is the doctrine of too big to fail. Its corollary is the so-called moral hazard. The sense that an institution, its creditors, its management, even its stockholders, will be inclined to tolerate highly aggressive risk in the expectation that it will be rescued from possible failure by official financial support. Now, that's not really a new concern. Financial, commercial banks are engaged in a risky business, and in the ordinary course of their business, they've been protected by deposit insurance, by access to Federal Reserve credit, and time of stress. And in practice, creditors of the largest banking institutions, the largest banking institutions, have been protected. The quid pro quo has been extensive regulation to limit risk, the underlying assumption has been quite correctly, in my view, that these banking institutions perform absolutely critical functions in our economy. They manage the payment systems nationally and internationally in a variety of currencies. They provide safe and liquid deposit facilities. They are an indispensable source of credit to most businesses. But now the situation has been changed. A vast shadow banking system has emerged. Investment banks have become financial trading machines. Thousands of hedge funds and private equity funds are active, operating in large part on borrowed funds. Financial affiliates of some industrial firms have expanded into the capital markets and in the midst of the crisis have jeopardized the stability of their parent corporations. Derivatives, including the notorious credit default swaps, hardly known a decade ago, have become speculative vehicles, exceeding their use as hedging instruments. Fragmented regulation and supervision at present at all, at present at all has been weak. Now, to a substantial extent, it was those non-banks that were at the epicenter of the crisis. Departing from well-established central banking practices and with active government support, the largest of those institutions received massive assistance to remain viable. Now, dealing with that great extension of moral hazard has become the greatest challenge for financial reform. Central in thinking in dealing with that problem in both the United States and in Europe has been the creation of a new resolution authority, an authority that would supersede conventional bankruptcy procedures. Essentially, the concept is that an official agency, following established procedural safeguards, that agency, presumably in the United States, will be the FDIC, could seize control of a systemically critical but failing institution. In doing so, it would, a deal, it would a deal with its immediate obligations to maintain continuity in the marketplace. But its real responsibility would be to promptly arrange for an ordinary, orderly liquidation. Stockholders and management would be gone. Creditors would be placed at risk as in a normal bankruptcy. Ideally, the path toward liquidation including the sale, the part of the company, company, would be eased by setting out what's come to be called a living will, a set out plan for uh, liquidating the company and disillusion priorities. Put simply, the concept is to prepare for a dignified burial. It's not a question of intensive care with hopes for recovery. The largest non-bank institutions would also, for the first time, be subject to integrated supervision with respect to capital, leverage, and liquidity. And in this Senate bill, it happens that those matters would be overseen by the Federal Reserve, which would be an addition to their past clearly laid out responsibilities. Now, the intent is to permit those non-banks to compete without heavy intrusion, compete to innovate, to actively trade, to make profits, free of highly detailed intrusive regulation, but also free to fail. Mm -hmm. 
In sum, there will continue to be a, sa a federal safety net implicitly subsidizing strongly regulated commercial banks. That's been the practice for decades, even for centuries here and abroad. Other institutions, however large, and their creditors should not expect official protection. The clear possibility of failure without a bailout will presumably be reflected in lower credit ratings for non-bank institutions, in higher financing costs, and in market-imposed restraints on leverage and otherwise, which is as, as it should be. The logic of that approach is embedded in the Senate bill. Commercial banking would implicitly be supported in its wide range of customer and relationship-oriented businesses, but proprietary trading, hedge funds, and other potentially profitable but risky activities not related to their essential responsibilities would be restricted. The clear logic is that taxpayers need not and should not be called upon to support essentially speculative activities within the protected, implicitly subsidized financial commercial banking sector. There are other key elements in the Senate bill. Importantly, there's a strong effort to force trading, clearance, and settlement of derivatives into organized exchanges and clearinghouses. Mm -hmm. New responsibilities for coherent oversight of the entire financial system are set out. Regulatory authorities are clarified. In all these areas, a high degree of international cooperation is necessary. And indeed, it's my hope that if we can get this bill passed in the Senate, cleared in conference with the House, signed by the President, the United States will be in a much stronger position for leading other major countries into coherent reform efforts. Now, I fully realize none of these reforms will assure crisis-free financial markets in the year ahead. The point is only to keep the inevitable excesses and points of strain manageable, to reduce their scale, reduce their frequency, and in the process, more effectively contribute to the efficient allocation of our financial resources, which after all is the main purpose of the exercise. Now, as you well know, the critical policy issues we face go way beyond the technicalities and regulation of financial markets. There is growing awareness of historically large and persistent fiscal deficits in a number of well-developed economies, the United States is not exempt. The risk associated with the virtually unprecedented levels of public debt as we emerge from recessions are evident. Here in California, in my own state in New York, it's not a matter of intellectual awareness. It's a matter of practical confrontation day by day. If we need any further illustration of the potential threats to our own economy from uncontrolled borrowing, we have only to look at the struggle to maintain the common European currency, <coughs> to rebalance the European economy, and to sustain the economic and political cohesion of Europe. Suddenly, amounts approaching a trillion dollars have been marshaled from national and international resources to deal with those challenges to the common currency. Financing can buy time, but it can't buy indefinite time. The underlying hard fiscal and economic adjustments are necessary. But as we look to that European experience, in the midst of crisis and emergency, let's consider our own situation. We are not a small country. We are not highly vulnerable to speculative attack. In an uncertain world, our currency and credit are still well established. But there are serious questions, most immediately about the sustainability of our commitment to growing entitlement programs. Looking only a little further ahead, there are even larger questions of critical importance, the need to achieve a consensus for effective action against global warming, for energy independence and protecting the environment. And those challenges are not going to go away. Are we really prepared to meet those problems and particularly their related fiscal implications? If not, 
today's general concerns may soon become tomorrow's crisis, a crisis extending way beyond the world of finance. You know, I referred at the start of these remarks to my sense five years ago of intractable problems. And I think it's evident from what I said, little has happened to allay those concerns. But of course, it's not literally true that our economic problems are intractable. They are not beyond our ability to react, to make the necessary adjustments. The question is whether we will act. And permit me a small note of optimism. A few days ago, I spent a little time in Ireland. That's a small country. It's got few resources and, to put it mildly, a troubled history. In the last 20 years, however, it took a great leap forward, escaping from its economic lethargy and its internal conflicts, responding to the potential of free and open markets and the stable European currency, standard of living, have bounded higher in a way that could never have been anticipated, reaching close to the general European level. Instead of immigration out of Ireland, there's been an influx of workers into Ireland from abroad. But now Ireland's been caught up in its own speculative excesses, caught up in very large financial deficits. All of that's culminated in a sharp economic decline. I can testify to the fact there's a lot of grumbling. You can't get in the taxi in Ireland without hearing about the banks, and that they all ought to be lined up and shot. There's an understanding that the boom had gotten out of hand. There seems to me a determination to do something about the situation. And that determination is reflected not just in the words of the political leaders, but in considerable public support for action. I think there is a clear sense there of what's at stake, that the gains they made, the enormous gains they made in recent years have been placed in jeopardy. The urgent need is to get back on a sustainable budgetary and economic track, and that's well understood. Now, I hope my quick impressions of Irish attitudes and policies will be borne out, and that that's one small country that will not be caught up by a European crisis beyond its control. In the United States, it's clear we don't yet share the same sense of urgency. We view ourselves still as huge and relatively self-sufficient in control of our own destiny. We have time to sort out our priorities and decide what to do, and to do it. And there are elements of truth in those comforting propositions. But I have to say the time we have is growing short. Restoring our fiscal position, dealing with Social Security, dealing with health care obligations in a responsible way, sorting out a reasonable approach toward limiting carbon emissions, and producing domestic energy without unacceptable environmental risks all take time, and we better get to it. That will require a greater sense of common purpose and political consensus than has been evident in Washington or the country at large. Now, to build our consensus, the economic issues will need to be clarified and understood, and therein lies the challenge for CEPRA, bringing to the debate both substance and prestige right at the intersection of the academic and public policy communities. I thank you for inviting me and for bestowing upon me this special award I prize it because of the nature of this institution. I prize it even more because of my friendship with George Schultz and my respect for the men and women who have joined him in nurturing and supporting this important work in what I understand is a brand new building. Thank you very much for having me. Questions? Yeah.
So let's do a time check. We'll do 20 minutes of questions, then we'll have dinner. Uh, and I did want to say there's only one speaker tonight, so no speeches, just questions. Uh, <laughs> you didn't say there'd be any answers. <laughs> Who would like to, here's a question right here. I think we have a microphone that can get to you. Dr. Dr. Vogel, um, when you decided it was time to shake inflation out of the U.S. economy, to grab the economy by the throat and shake it till the inflation was gone, did you have any idea the long-term rates would have to go to 14 to 16 and short-term rates with a two-handle before you got the job done? No. Did I have any expectation that rates, interest rates would reach? One time the prime rate was 21.5%. I probably would have resigned right away if I... <laughs> but once you get, you know, once you get started on a course, you stick to it. Uh, let me say one thing. I think a difference then and now, not in the particulars, but in attitudes. Uh, what made that possible, I always thought, and I think it's true, that there was a feeling in the country that something needed to be done. The country wasn't happy. The old Malay story, stagflation, growth was not good and inflation was rising, and the country was ready to take or accept, happily or unhappily, action that would have been unacceptable in other circumstances. That's a little bit the flavor I thought I saw in Ireland. I may be imagining it, but I hope not. But I, I think that's just what's happened there. There's an understanding in the public that something went wrong. They're willing to take fairly drastic action. That is not the case, I'm afraid, in the United States right now. Okay, we've got a little glare here, but raise your hand. Over here, we'll get to some of the back rows later. Yes. Dr. Volker, in order to make this a question and not a speech, do you believe the federal government is capable of managing our financial institutions and the rest of the job that they have ahead of them? Ahead of them? Well, I, I don't know what quite you have in mind when you ask when the federal government is capable of managing the financial institution. One thing I will tell you I think they are incapable of we are incapable as a country of managing is a hybrid institution that's half government and half private. And we have two big examples of that in the uh, mortgage area that went along for years uh, with conflicting uh, incentives. And for a while, somehow it worked out all right, but at the end of the day, it did not. And we've got to rebuild the mortgage market from the ground up. And that's not a job for this year, but we've got to get to it next year. But I hope we do not repeat this idea that we can hybrid, have hybrid institutions uh, caught between responsibilities to their stockholders and, caught, and responsibilities to the public. Uh, now, there may be room for some public institutions even intervening in the market. Maybe you need some backstop in the mortgage market, which 50 years ago was the idea of Fannie Mae, but it was a public institution. And I don't think there should be many of those. And I, if the sense of your question is the government should be out of the financial markets as much as possible, I agree. The only question is as much as possible is what's possible. And I would like to see a structure in the market, as I tried to suggest, that banks are going to be regulated but let's not try to regulate everything in great detail. Let's try to create a picture where the market will take care of itself if the risk of failure is very real, as well as the chance of success. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, sit it, sit, sit, sit it down there, right? Yeah, Dr. Volker, thank you so much for coming here. Um, in your presentation, the policies that, that you propose um, in mostly mean a deleveraging of the system, less speculation of the system, speculators moving to entities that have lower credit ratings and so forth. Now, if not, um, if, if these policies were to be implemented or are implemented, 
uh, that may mean a significant deceleration in economic activity, a, a recession. Um, do you think that both on the fiscal and the monetary side, those sort of slowdowns will be accepted or that other policies will be put in place to stem against that? Because ultimately, while everybody would like to have a um, less leveraged system, um, it also seems that um, we want to have the days of 2006 again as far as economic activity is concerned. How do you think that will be addressed? So is the question that if leverage is taken out of these institutions, that that will tend to be recessionary? Exactly. And how and will policymakers react to that, in your view? Well, of course, this is a question of balance. I, the system got much too leveraged, in my judgment, and almost everybody's judgment, not just in the United States, but abroad. And at that point, it becomes destabilizing, because when some potentially destabilizing threat came along, and it was most obviously in the subprime mortgage area, uh, it led to a, a, a collapse of one institution after another uh, that were all interconnected and didn't have the, the cushion that larger, less leverage and larger levels of uh, capital would have provided. So it's a question of, of achieving a balance. Now, I think that balance will be found in higher capital requirements for commercial banks than we've had recently, and capital requirements for big non-banks. But I would accept this point. I don't think we can rely upon capital requirements alone to deal with this problem, because you make the capital requirements high enough to provide a kind of fail-safe system, it will not be profitable. And you, you have a fail-safe system, but it won't be a very productive system. So my, without getting into great detail, yeah, capital, reduced leverage, should have something that's some advantages. And if we convince the non-banks they're subject to failure, they will have to keep more capital and less leverage in their own interest. But we can't, we've got to get a structure that uh, does not involve capital requirements as the only solution, or regulation is the only solution. We've got to set some, some guidelines that hopefully will make the market operate better on its own because of the internal incentives of the market, which include, again, uh, the possibility of failure. Let me ask my own, my own question. Uh, in the last nine months or so, six to nine months, the economy seemed to be, U.S. economy seemed to be recovering relatively nicely. But in the last couple of months, uh, Europe's uh, troubles have, have really come to light. How much could Europe's situation derail the U.S. recovery? Well, the European situation I don't think should derail the U.S. economy if the U.S. economy is, in fact, on a reasonable course of recovery. It might slow it down a bit. But when you say the U.S. economy is proceeding, it is proceeding, but it's not proceeding normally if you look at the context of the recovery from a recession. Normally, the economy bounces back very fast from a recession, and you will have a period of a year or two years of 6 7 even 8% growth. I do not think we're going to have that this time. And the economy is still being held up by the stimulus program, which is probably at its peak effectiveness right now. So it has benefited from a lot of uh, government spending in the short run. Presumably that's going to be reduced. So we have a subnormal recovery. Uh, the problem we have, we've had too much consumption, too few exports for our appetite to import, too little investment at this point, I think. How do we move the economy, to put it in numerical terms, how do we move the economy about 5% lower in consumption? And I'm talking about 5% against a growing economy, hopefully. How do we move over a period of years about 5% of consumption into 5% of exports and investment? And you don't do that overnight. And it doesn't help if Europe is in recession at the same time. So we've got a real challenge ahead of us. I don't think there's any question about that. We'll have time for some more questions. Uh, I see uh, one here. Yep. Microphone is on its way. <laughs> 
I didn't. <laughs> I think it was right here. Right, right there. There we go. Paul, in, in addition to the Volcker rule and the capital requirements that are considered necessary to prevent excessive um, speculation on the part of commercial banks, why can't we combine both a capital ratio standard as well as a, identifying risk uh, areas within the banking system that would hold different capital ratios um, that would pre prevail over this this area of, of uh, business. Yeah, I, uh, I mean, my simple answer to that is you can. I mean, in my view, some of this stuff just ought to be rolled out, prohibited. It, it doesn't serve any uh, great purpose for the economy, and it certainly distracts from the more what I consider the more fundamental uh, responsibilities of commercial banks. You know, John Reed, who used to be. Uh, a kind of opponent of mine back when I was central bank governor, and Citibank always thought they ran the banking system, and I thought the Federal Reserve ran the banking system. So there's a certain amount of conflict there. But he has become the most eloquent uh, exponent of the point of view I have about what commercial banks ought to be doing on the basis of cultural considerations, which I think are very real. He says, you mix a kind of traditional commercial banking mentality and approach, a lot of worries about credit, a lot of worries about continuity, a lot of fail-safe procedures, or you should, and you mix that with a trading mentality, very high risk, very high rewards, great big bonuses. You've got a mixture putting those two, trying to put those two cultures together gives you a bad bank, is basically what he says. Because the trading mentality, getting highly paid, begins infecting the commercial bankers who say, why don't I speculate on a few subprime mortgages and make some money so I get the attention of management, just like those traders do, uh, to put it very specifically. And I think that is a real problem. Now, in practice, I say I want to prohibit some of that activity at the margin, there's always be going to be some of that activity that, you know, it's got a little of the flavor of uh, customer business, a fundamental business, a little bit of the flavor of more than a little of speculation. I think there is some point at that intersection where you may say the answer is a special, a special capital requirement on that particular activity to make sure it's stamped down. That's a little different than a capital requirement in general on the bank. This is a capital requirement used as a regulatory restraint. And it may be the, it may have a big part to play in the end. Over here, I saw a question. First of all, uh, congratulations. Thank you for your service to the United States of America, Mr. Volker. Thank you. Question for you about uh, taxes and restoring fiscal responsibility. Uh, I'd be interested in your thoughts on contrast and comparison, uh, comparing uh, income tax with value added tax and how we restore sort of balance in the federal government between those two. <laughs> I look at my watch for that one. I... This will take us to dinner. Yeah, well, let me, okay, let me give you my little standard lecture on, on this uh, point. If you look back for 10 or 15 years, for some reason, uh, our tax system generates between 18 and 19% of the GDP. And it's, it's strange because, you know, we kind of raise taxes and lower taxes and we change taxes here and there at the margin. However you put it into the mixing bowl, it always comes out 18.5% to exaggerate a little bit, which I think tells you a little bit that we maybe we've reached the limit of our capacity to tax uh, the income tax in general, the payroll tax, which is very heavy, the corporate tax, which is clearly too high to start with, uh, so I don't think there's any easy way within the present tax system to raise more revenues if we have to. Now, expenditures tended to be around 20%. So we chronically had a small and manageable deficit. The current trend of expenditures over the next four or five years says you've got to be something with an optimist to say it's 25% of the GDP. Now, I, don't, I think we can do better than that. 
but it's, and I, I hope we will. We can take measures to reduce the rate at which the expenditures are growing. But you've got to be very optimistic to say it's going to go back to 20 percent. And if despite all our efforts we can't get to or very close to 20 percent, you've got to look at the revenue side. And here's where I get in trouble. I'll get another editorial in the Wall Street Journal. But I, uh, when you look at the revenue side, what can you do? Well, you can think if you want to take some bets out against global warming, which I think we should, a carbon tax might be an interesting thing to do to kill two birds at one stone. If you're really worried about energy independence, which I am, and also an environmental thing, you might think about a more general tax on energy. I mean, what are we doing sitting here with a gas, gasoline tax or whatever it is, when you look at Ireland, it costs a liter of gas in Ireland costs about what a gallon does here. And they're not a great oil producer, last I heard. Uh, and then, if you don't like those two options, and this is place where obviously CEPRA ought to be doing a lot of work, I presume it is. If we really have to look for more revenue, should we think of a value-added tax? And if you ever did a value-added tax, I think you do it in a way that replaced some of the existing taxes. Um, so that's, that's where I am, and I, I, it's, it's hard to come up with a different answer, I think, I, unless you, there's an interesting experiment, actually, in New Jersey, and then we will quit. I, what do you people in California know about New Jersey? I mean, you may know, but I grew up in New Jersey, and I, but New Jersey has a big budget deficit, it's probably at least as big as New York's in relative terms, and probably as big in uh, relative terms as uh, California. But they have a new governor, and he has sworn never to raise any taxes, and he went in and immediately proposed a budget that drastically cuts expenditures. A lot of school teachers are going to be out of work, a lot of burden is going to be put on local government, and school teacher salaries are not going to go up very fast. That's the big expense, and Medicaid's the other big expense. Uh, but he really is cutting what anybody would think politically is very drastically. Now, the interesting fact is with all these drastic cuts in expenditures, it takes care of about one-third of the deficit. So he's going to take care of another third or more Guess what? By not paying any money into the pension system. Now that is not exactly a uh, uh, hard-shelled, uh, that's what New Jersey's been doing for, for years. Uh, so even in that kind of test case, and I give the man credit for the boldness with which he has uh, attacked the expenditure thing, it's some indication of how hard it is to do the whole job on uh, expenditure side, certainly in a brief period of time. So enjoy your dinner. We will bring Paul back after dinner, just briefly. We'll present you that. We'd like you to come and receive this prize. I'm distracted by talking to the wife. You want? Thank you. Now, Paul, I know because I was sitting next to Anka this evening that you're planning to go up to Napa Valley and have a good time after this. But here is this uh, big plaque that we present to you in claret. And it's all set up, framed, signed, and everything. Beautiful. Well, I really... We're going to mail it to you. Good. That's the best thing of all. Thank you. That's terrific. We present it with pleasure. Well, thank you, George. And John, yeah. but there's more. John? There's more. Well, I was just going to say uh, a couple of things. One is, you may think that we honored Paul Volcker tonight, but Paul Volcker, you honored us at CEPR right. tonight. Thank you. Well... <clears throat> Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> Secondly, this isn't quite the truth, but George and I were thinking about one of those tacky 12-foot checks. Uh, and uh, I asked Stanford, you know, could they produce one? And they said, 
the checks in the mail. So Paul, oh! so Paul you've heard it before, well, the checks in the mail. Well, I didn't know about a check. Remember? We'll see about that. I, we'll see what we can do for the public service. There you go. Say, Paul, I'm going to whisper to Anka how much it is. Okay? My God. Good. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you all. That's it.